And that was amazing. But not because of what I was playing, but because of the fact that I could actually do something like that. So what is it as a human that gives me the ability to do something like play a guitar? Well, it all boils down to traits. One important trait is my well-adapted hand that lets me play the instrument, but also make the instrument, make the tools that help me make the instrument, and also my large brain that allows me to generate and understand symbolic thought and artistic expression. But humans are just one type of organism among the many, many, many different types that you would find on the Earth. Now, even though we seem varied and diverse, we are in fact just one type. So where do humans fall within the whole scope of life? Well, thankfully science came up with a system of classification, the Linnaean taxonomical classification system to be exact. So let's begin at the beginning. The cells of a human are considered eukaryotic cells, and what that means is that they have a true nucleus that houses their genetic information. They also have membranous compartments or organelles. Now this separates us from all bacterial forms of life. But there's a lot of eukaryotic cells out there, so what type are we? Well, we're considered animals. And what it means to be an animal is that you embryonically will develop from different tissue layers or germ layers, and you also ingest food in order to get nutrients. Now this allows us to separate ourselves from plants and algae that can make their own food. It also separates us from fungi that have to absorb nutrients from their external environment. But there's a lot of animals out there, and so humans are considered chordates. And what it means to be a chordate is that you have a stiff fibrous support structure within your body. Now, the majority of chordates have a more complex skeletal structure known as backbone. And so the majority of chordates are considered vertebrates. Now, as a vertebrate, this differentiates us from all of the creepy crawly things out there in the world. So different types of worms and insects. It also will separate us from soft-bodied animals like clams, snails, or even an octopus. But fish have backbones and reptiles have backbones. So how are we any different? Well, humans are considered mammals. Now, including humans, there's approximately 5,400 different types of known mammals. And to be considered a mammal, you'll probably display a certain set of characteristics, such as mammary glands that produce milk, which is where the name mammal comes from. You'll probably also be warm-blooded or endothermic with a layer of fat underneath your skin. Most likely, you'll probably also have hair or fur. And you'll also have teeth that are differentiated, meaning that some of your teeth have been adapted for shearing and cutting like your incisors, and some of your teeth have been adapted for grinding and crushing like your molars. Now, all mammals can be divided up into three basic categories. First are the monotremes. Now, these are the most ancestral types of mammals. This is where you find animals like an echidna, or a platypus. And these are animals that have retained the ability to lay eggs. The second group are known as the marsupials, like a koala or a kangaroo. The marsupials have a maternal pouch where their young will develop. And the third group are known as the eutherians. And these are the placental mammals. And this is where you find humans. Now, one group of eutherian mammal is known as the primates, and they began to emerge approximately 50 million years ago. Now, the primate order takes into account more ancestral types of primates, like lemurs and bush babies, new and old world monkeys, as well as a group known as the apes, where you'll find humans. Now, in order to be a primate, you have to have a specific set of characteristics. And this is where we begin to really see human-like characteristics taking hold. Primates generally have a larger brain in relation to their body size, and they often will have a reduced jaw size. Now this is really important because a reduced jaw size will basically flatten the face as the jaw pulls in towards the skull. Now what this does is actually move the eyes from the sides of the head, like you'll find in other types of mammals, towards the center of the head. Now this allows for the development of what's known as stereoscopic vision, or 3D vision. And in addition to this, most primates 
have evolved the ability to see color. Now to be a primate, you probably have grasping hands and feet. Primates have what's known as an opposable thumb. Now this is a thumb that's separated from all the other digits of the hand and has free range of motion. It can also touch the bottom or ventral side of every finger on the hand, and that's what is considered an opposable thumb. All primates also have fingerprints, which are thought to have something to do with friction between a surface and the hand. You'll also find that primates no longer have claws. Instead, they have flattened nails on the top of their fingers. Now, if you consider all the adaptations to the head and the hands of primates, you can see how they become very well suited to living in trees, or an arboreal type of lifestyle. You now have hands that can grasp, they lack claws so that they won't get stuck. You have 3D vision, and that vision is now colorized. Now this was great until about seven or eight million years ago when global climate began to change and the trees that these primates inhabited began to dwindle. Now what occurred is a group of primates began to adapt to life on the land. And this group of primates now begins the lineage that we consider to be hominins. These are all proto-humans. There's approximately 20 extinct groups of proto-humans that all stem from this lineage of primates who decided to leave the safety of the trees and adapted to life on the ground. Now over the seven million years that it took for modern humans to emerge, what we see develop are the characteristics of modern humans. For instance, reduced canine teeth size, smaller jaws with a flatter face, a larger skull with a bigger brain, but most importantly, the development of bipedal locomotion. Now the oldest fossil that we know about is called Salanthropus chidensis. It's about six and a half million years old. So this seems to be the branch between chimps and hominins. This fossil in particular shows bipedal locomotion. And they can tell that in part by the position of what's known as the foramen magnum. What that is, is basically the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord passes through. Now, the more that's positioned at the base of the skull, the more the animal has to have an upright posture. Now in keeping with bipedal locomotion development, there came the fossil Ardipithecus rhamnus from about four and a half million years ago. They knew that this animal stood upright more frequently than its predecessor based on the bone structure of its pelvis, legs, and feet. Now this gave way to yet another hominin species that's referred to as Australopithecus afarensis from about 3.2 million years ago. Now, this animal is more commonly known as the famous fossil Lucy. Now, Australopithecus afarensis had fully humanized teeth and hands and showed signs of exclusive bipedalism, meaning that it walked upright almost all the time. Now the only problem was that its brain was only about one-third the size of a modern human, and so that had a little bit of catching up to do. But that came with the next big transition to the genus that we consider to be our own, Homo, meaning human. And the first important fossil of this genus is Homo habilis, the handyman, who is now able to take that fully humanized hand and use it for very, very precise activities like making tools and using tools. This represents a paradigm shift for hominin evolution. The precise control over objects in conjunction with a larger brain really laid the foundation for hominin species who came later, specifically Homo erectus, who hails from about 2 million to about 1.5 million years ago. Now, Homo erectus was a taller, more slender version of Homo habilis. And being a slender version of Homo habilis, they were more well adapted to walking longer distances. And it's thought that Homo erectus was the first hominin species to actually leave Africa and populate other areas of the world. Now, additionally, because those animals were getting taller and more slender, while at the same time their brains were getting larger, the birth process became harder. And so it's thought that at this point in time, 
children were beginning to be born that were underdeveloped and needed care, and so this required more of a social network. Now, Homo erectus, with its larger brain and taller slender frame, actually did pretty well for itself, not going extinct until about 200,000 years ago. But more importantly, it laid the foundation for the hominin species to come afterwards. Specifically, Homo heidelbergensis. Now, it gets a little bit confusing, but Homo heidelbergensis is believed to have evolved from an older version of Homo erectus, known as Homo ergaster, that never left Africa. Now, Homo heidelbergensis is thought to have had a larger brain, almost comparable to a modern human, and also a more complex social structure. And more importantly, Homo heidelbergensis is thought to be the branch point that led to modern humans but also led to the development of Homo neanderthalensis. Now, Neanderthals were contemporaries of modern humans, and they were around from about 300,000 years ago to about 28,000 years ago. And it's even thought that the two species actually interbred. It's also important not to think about early hominins as chimpanzees, or even having evolved from chimpanzees. Now, even though chimps are our closest animal cousin, Chimps themselves have been evolving for as long as humans have. They represent their own evolutionary path and the tip of their own evolutionary tree. Now, it's also important not to think about human evolution as a direct straight line, leading from an early hominin to a modern human. And at many times, there were multiple hominin species that coexisted and possibly competed with each other. Now, when you think about all of the different characteristics of hominins, it's important to remember that these characteristics didn't evolve in tight unison. Homo sapiens are the byproduct of a meandering evolutionary path. When you talk about human evolution, it's worth mentioning that it is itself an evolving field, and that new discoveries are being made all the time. So, for instance, in 2004, a new hominin species was found known as Homo floresiensis. Now, this type of hominin lived in Indonesia up through about 13,000 years ago. More recently, the Denisovan hominins were found in Russia, and it's thought that these were an even more contemporary type of hominin that crossed over with modern humans just like Neanderthals did. So even though we don't know everything about human evolution or the lineage that leads exactly to modern humans, just be thankful that in the scope of all hominins that ever lived, you're the one that's left that's trying to put the pieces together. And remember, science bonds us.